Don't ever let anybody near your face with a razor. My older brother Blue went down the barber because he never had a shave. He said, I don't like to shave He's because I can't get a close shave. Barber says, I'll show you how to do a real good job. He said, take this little wooden ball, put it in your mouth. Blue put it in his mouth. He said, shove it over against your cheek. Blue did that. He shaved him. He said, what do you think of that? Blue said, man, he said, that's the closest shave I ever had in my life. Well, what would happen if I swallowed that ball? The barber said, well, just do like all my other customers do. Bring it back tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> Never been married. He used to live with a couple of women. And until they found him and threw him out. But he's never been married. Ever since we got out of school, we've been going to these other people's weddings. And after every single wedding, Aunt Tilly would walk up to him, grab him by the cheek and say, you're next. After every single wedding, she walked up and grabbed him by the cheek and say, you're next. I said, Blue, I said, uh, does Aunt Tilly still come up to you, grab you by the cheek after every wedding and say, you're next? He said, no, nah. he said, ever since the last funeral we were at, after the funeral was all over, he so I walked up to her, grabbed her by the cheek and said, you're next. <laughs> he come over one time and he said, listen, he said, I just fixed Aunt Tilly's half ton pickup. Come on, he said, we'll take it for a test ride. I said, Blue, it said, it get kind of late, you know. I said, I'm pretty tired. I said, I don't want to go. I said, come on, I said, get in the truck. I get in the truck, we drove 10 miles down an old dirt road I haven't been on in years. Broke down at the end of 10 miles. We're walking back home. It's pitch black out. I said, what are we going to do now, Blue? He said, there's a light over there in the field. He said, let's go over and see if she'll drive us home. So we walked over and knocked on the door. Woman come to the door, turned out that she's a widow. She wouldn't drive us home. But she said, we could come in for the night. Man, I am so tired, I fell asleep on the coach. Nine and a half months later, <laughs> I get an official looking letter in the mail from a lawyer. I read it, and I go looking for my stupid older brother, Blue. I said, Blue, I said, that night we stayed at that widow woman's house. You just didn't have to spend some time in her room other day, did you? He said, well, yeah. I said, you never told her that you were me and gave her my address, did you? He said, well, he said, I didn't think you'd mind. I said, I don't. She just died and left me her farm. <laughs> she, uh, you know, my, when you're traveling around an awful lot, you know, it, it gets kind of lonesome in those, in those uh, hotels all by yourself. You know, your wife doesn't come with you. So I phoned my older brother Blue and I said, Blue, I said, how did you ever get over being lonesome in bed after them women kicked you out? He said, a long time ago, he said, I learned how to fool myself into thinking there's a woman in bed with me. I said, how'd you do that? He said, I shaved one leg. <laughs> years ago, we got a new reverend in town, the Reverend Hindquarter. And he brought his younger sister, 55-year-old Helga Hindquarter with him. Oh, what a controlling woman that was. Oh, she took over the egg society. She took over the church. She even took over the Robbie Burns Festival. Man, me and Blue run over the Robbie Burns Festival one time, and all of a sudden I hear this voice saying, Blue, you look mighty handsome in a kilt. I kind of figure anybody thinks my brother looks handsome and he killed ain't all there. But the next thing I see, Blue is over at her booth and he's bought a kilt. And he's chatting her up. Next thing I know, he's courting her. Come May when he should have been in the garden planting potatoes, he was in town making hay. <laughs> and then my older brother Blue bought her an engagement ring. My cheap older brother Blue bought Helga Hindquarter an engagement ring. Well, maybe it was a second-hand ring, but he paid a good $7 for that ring to the undertaker. <laughs> then the day he wanted to be alone with Helga to propose, he took her to the back of the garden where we had that old two-hole biffy. And there he set her upon the seat and resplendent in his kilt, he knelt one knee upon the floor. Helga all of a sudden dawned on her that some man was going to finally ask for her hand of marriage. And she became emotional, teary-eyed emotional to the point where something fell out. 
Older Brother Blue never noticed what was going on up there until something hit the floor, rolled along, and come to rest against his bare knee. And when he looked down, there was an eyeball looking back at him. <laughs> he looked up and Hulk was looking down her nose at him with one eye while blowing her nose so hard that her false teeth had come part way out before she was able to cram them back in. Well, Blue ain't the sharpest stick at the weenie roast. <laughs> but he was smart enough to see the woman was coming apart at the seams. And he busted down that toilet door and getting away. Helga could see her only chance for marriage receding off into the distance, and she gave chase. Blue said about the time a wooden foot went clipping past his ear, he realized the woman had a wooden leg and it had busted off at the ankle. He figured he could get rid of her if he ran up and down, up and down, up and down that there's soft plowed dirt of the garden. And that's what he done. Up and down, up and down, up and down that soft plowed dirt he ran. He said, but he could hear her gaining with every step. Stomp, poke, stomp, poke, stomp, poke. He said the only good thing about that run up and down that garden was the next day he could go back and plant the best crop of potatoes we ever had. <laughs> He said she finally caught him as he was leading her down the garden path. But by that time she'd worked up such a sweat that her wig had fallen off. He said, I told her, I told her right then and there I couldn't marry her. He said, I didn't think it was right that two bald-headed people should be standing at the altar and neither one of them was the preacher. I said, so you ain't going to marry her, Blue? He said, I ain't marrying no woman who's looking down her nose at me with one eye while the other one's rolling around on the floor looking up underneath my kilt. <laughs> Pillar of the community, but she's such a prude. Man, she's looking after a little two-year-old boy one time. Little two-year-old boy says, Man, I tell you I gotta go tinkle. She said, Don't you say tinkle to me. If you've gotta go tinkle, you'll tell me you have to whisper. Two o'clock in the middle of the night, the little boy, he has to go tinkle. He goes looking for Aunt Tilly. Walked into the wrong bedroom, woke up my older brother Blue. Blue said, What do you want? The little boy says, I gotta whisper. Blue said, well, let's not wake up Aunt Tilly. Whisper in my ear. <laughs> hot July day. Oh, you wouldn't believe how hot it is. Aunt Tilly and Blue come back from doing their shopping. There on the side of the road is a big fancy BMW. Flat tire. Fancy woman standing beside it. Well, Brother Blue, he get out and he said, ma'am, he said, I'll give you a hand fixing that tire. But we got ice cream and meat in the back of the truck. We got to get it home and get in the freezer. Come on. Woman jumped in the truck, three drove back up. Blue and Aunt Tilly's taking the, the ice cream and the meat and stuff like that into the house. And this woman gets looking around at the patio that me and Blue have got built for Aunt Tilly. Nice overhanging tree and a nice little table underneath it. You can see down at the river and the mountains in the back. Aunt Tilly come out and that their woman said, ma'am, she said, this is a beautiful place for a tea party. Aunt Tilly jumped right on top of that man. She wants to meet these high mucky mucks. She said, you bring your friends Friday. You bring your friends Friday. She said, we'll put on a tea party. And that's what they done. Man, they made up all these plans. Aunt Tilly, she went out and she bought some fancy crackers and some fancy tea and she bought some salmon. She's going to make some of them nice little finger sandwiches for these ladies. Friday comes, she opened up the can of salmon. And it didn't smell quite right. She said, Blue, she said, this here salmon doesn't smell quite right. What'll I do with it? Blue said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, take a little bit, but put it in a dog's dish. If the dog eats it and it doesn't die, it's all right. That's what they done. They put it in there. The dog ate it. Man, he wanted more. Aunt Tilly, she kicked the dog out. Blue, he went out to work. She made these finger sandwiches. The women come. She's networking with him. Oh, she's having a wonderful time. Networking with him, and after a while she decided, man, I better go in and make some more tea. She walked into the kitchen, and just as she walked into the kitchen, my older brother Blue opened up the back door and yelled in, the dog's dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, she said, there must have been poison, the salmon must have been poison. She's running around, going into a panic. She phoned up Doc Horn, Doc Horn said, that could be salmonella, could be homemade poison. You better get them women down to the hospital. And Tilly goes running under, oh, the salmon's poison, we gotta go to the hospital. All these big Lamborghinis and Cadillacs and big MGs and all that stuff all headed for the hospital, all being led by Aunt Tilly in their 1949 Fargo half-ton pink. <laughs> <laughs> they get down to the hospital and a doctor pumped them out from the top. He pumped them out from the bottom. He pumped them out from every which way. Then he phoned their husbands to come and get him. Oh, Aunt Tilly was broken hearted. She was mortified. 
She walked back into the kitchen of her home, and there's my older brother Blue leaning against the counter. And he said, and you know, the fellow who ran over that dog never even stopped. <laughs> Hotel in Calgary a little while ago for the Chamber of Commerce. And my wife's not going to come with me. Uh, she doesn't like being seen in public. Really, so. And Tilly, she's going to come. She said, Can I come? Can I come? I said, Sure. I said, You can come if you want. Well, the night that we're going to go, Aunt Tilly gets a terrible cold. Her nose is running, her eyes are running. Oh, she's having a terrible time. You just use one handkerchief after the other. So, what she decides to do is to take a spare handkerchief. She puts it down in here, and she has her other handkerchief in her little glove. Well, we get there, and I do my spiel, and after I do my spiel, the busboys come, we were having a nice little meal, and the busboys come, they're clearing away stuff. They're moving the tables aside because there's a three-piece band up on the stage, and they're warming up. About that time, Aunt Tilly ran over the first handkerchief, and she goes digging around for the second one. And she's digging around, digging around, she can't find the dang thing. After a few minutes, the people sitting at our table stop doing what they're doing because they're watching Aunt Tilly. After a couple more minutes, the band stops warming up because they're watching Aunt Tilly. All of a sudden, it dawns on Aunt Tilly, man, it's awful quiet in here. She looks up, sees everybody looking at her, she said, well, I had two when I come in here. <laughs> So I, I really do appreciate you know all you people coming out here and I said Mabel, I said Aunt Tilly, I said you're a better cook than Mabel. Why don't you just make a pot roast supper and invite Creaky over? He'll forget all about Mabel. She said, that's what I'll do. That's what I'll do. I'll make a pot roast supper. And for dessert, the piece de resistance, home-baked apple pie right out of the oven. Maybe later on, a romantic candlelit evening of cribbage. And that's what she done, man. She made that pot roast supper and invited Creaky over. Creaky been working on his horses all day, and he just stunk to high heaven. And until he says, I ain't feeding you nothing. You get in that bathroom, you have a shower. I'm not feeding you nothing until you have that shower. Creaky went in, he got undressed, he's in there having a shower. Aunt Tilly opened up the door of the trailer to let some fresh air in, and she went working on that apple pie. What she never noticed was a baby skunk walked in through that open door. She was busy with the top on the apple pie, crimping the apple pie and stuff like that, and she never noticed until she took the apple pie and put it in the oven. And then she saw the baby skunk going underneath the Chesterfield. She let her scream to wake the dead. Oh, Creaky's in the shower, man. He thought somebody was attacking the old woman. He jumped out, wrapped a towel around himself, come bow-legging it out to the rescue. He got out there, Aunt Tilly, all she could do was scream and point at the Chesterfield. She couldn't tell him what was going on. Creaky finally figured, man, the only way I'm going to find out what's underneath that Chesterfield is to get down on my hands and knees and stick my head underneath there. Well, he just got down on his hands and knees. And my older brother Blue, stupid dog, walked in through that open door. <laughs> he saw that towel wrapped hump over there, and he went over to investigate. Just as Creaky stuck his head underneath that Chesterfield and saw that baby skunk, that dog stuck his nose up underneath that towel and cold nose Creaky. <laughs> Creaky thought the mama skunk had come in and sprayed him, and he fainted dead away. <laughs> Aunt Tilly thought he was having a heart attack. She ran over, hauled him out from underneath the Chesterfield, lifted him up, was trying to give him the moat to moat the suscitation, but she forgot she'd taken out her false teeth to print the apple pie. <laughs> and her moat had kicked her up so dang tight she couldn't get no air on <laughs> But she wasn't giving this chance up to have her lips up against Creaky's lips, and she had her lips up against Creaky's blowing for all she was worth, just as Creaky was coming to. Mabel, the other woman, walked in through the open door, delivering Aunt Tilly's Avon order. She saw them two lip to lip, and she swung that bag of Avon and cold caught Creaky again with a can of hair removal. I heard all the noise going on over there. I thought something was at the chicken behind the trailer. I grabbed the shotgun and went running over there. I got over there just as if two old women were hauling Creaky out to haul him off to the hospital. 
Man, I went up to close the door. I saw the skunk come up from underneath the Chesterfield. I lifted the shotgun, took a blast, missed the skunk, blew the leg off the end table. It tipped over on the romantic candle, caught the curtains on fire. <laughs> Them two old women dropped Creaky down the stairs, won't run him back in to put the fire out. When they come running back out, Creaky was coming too. He saw them two old women coming at him, and that's when he broke the cross-country speed run. <laughs> gone overboard so now I'm finished. <laughs>